Take your Bibles and join me in Ephesians chapter 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3. Remember, if you forgot, forgot to bring a Bible, heaven forbid, but if you did, there should be pew, a pew Bible in the rack in front of you. So help yourself uh, to that. That's why they're there. Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. We're going to try to cover... Uh, 11 verses, and you might find that hard to believe out of me, but uh, we're going to do that. It's not going to take that long to do it either, so that's two things to look forward to, right? Two surprises, 11 verses and not that fast, or not that slow. See, I can't even say it right. Not that slowly. We want to get to the Lord's Supper this morning, and we're always thrilled at how he takes us to the cross. Every passage takes us to the cross, so really every passage gets us ready for the Lord's Supper, and um, I'm anxious for us to see that uh, this morning from this, this passage in Ephesians chapter 3. So I want to read those verses. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I might actually read down through verse 13, even though we're not going to cover 12 and 13. So you follow along. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Paul wrote this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, but, as it, but it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Okay, let's pray for God's understanding of this passage together. Father, we thank you again for bringing us here this morning and giving us another opportunity to worship together. We know we can worship at any time in any place, and we can do that on our own. But we've also learned that it is a special thing, special not only for us, but special for you also for your people to worship together. We look forward to that day when all of your people of all time are together, worshiping constantly in your immediate presence, gathered around the throne, there with the Lamb who was slain for us. And we're worshiping you. We're, we're pouring out our hearts and what we've thought for so long and what we've believed and what we've felt in a glorified state to be able to give you the praise that you deserve. We long for that day. But until then, we're grateful for this Lord day, Lord's Day each week and what it means for us and for you. We're also grateful to have your word. We're grateful to be able to open it and read it. We're grateful for your Holy Spirit who teaches your people from within as we read your word. So, Father, I pray that as we open your word this morning, that he will do just that, that he will teach us, that he will enlighten us, that he will illuminate our minds, that he will show us these deep, eternal truths that Paul is writing about, and that he will give us understanding not just letting us see the words, but helping us to understand what the words mean, what they meant to these Gentile Christians years ago, what they mean to us as well, to us and for us, but ultimately for your name's sake. So help me, Father, as I teach this morning. Make my words as clear as possible. Bring glory to your Son. Honor his name. Leave us enamored with Jesus so that when we come to the Lord's Supper and we remember his life and his death, especially for us, he'll get what he deserves from his people this morning. That's what we want for him. 
So, Father, you make that happen, and we'll praise you for it. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, have you ever known anyone who was obsessed with something? There's all kinds of examples I could bring up to kind of get the wheels turning in your mind. Someone who has an obsession. That's, that's all they can think about. It's all they can talk about. It's all they, they want to be doing, and they want everybody else to be brought in with them. This time of year, I start to think about football fans. And you may know some obsessed football fans. You know, the, the guy who watches every away game on TV, and before he does that, he has a watch party. And so he makes all of this food and, and has little, little flags that he sticks in the, the, the hoagies that have the, 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 the emblem of his team on the flags. And he dresses in all the apparel for, for the watch party and then to watch the game on TV and invites all of his friends over to do that. You know the guy. Then he pays ridiculous prices to have season tickets to all the home games. And he tailgates in the parking lot before all the home games and does the same thing that he does at home on the away games. And, you know, his whole wardrobe, when he goes to work during the week, his whole road wardrobe is team apparel. We've got a brother-in-law that's like that. All Ohio State fans are like that, I think. Everything they wear is red, and everything's got the little O on it. And, you know, these people name their child after the star player on the team. They name their dog after the mascot of the team. And, you know, they've got the, the bumper sticker on the car and, and, the, and the, the license plate frame that with their team logo on it. Okay, you know the person, right? Some of you are grinning and laughing right now because you've got somebody in your mind. All that person can think about is that team. That's, that's what he talks about. That's what he reads about. He's listening to, to the radio, to programs uh, about the football team. It, it controls all of his actions. He's obsessed. Paul was obsessed. Not, obviously not with a football team, but Paul was obsessed like that. Paul's entire life revolved around what one thing. What was it? Christ. Christ and the cross. You can't really separate those two things. But Paul was obsessed with Jesus Christ. In this chapter, chapter 3, he expresses it very well. Maybe you were hearing it as I read those verses a second ago. You you hear it come out in Paul's letter, what he's writing to these Christians. It's just this obsession over Jesus Christ. And as I read it over and over this past week, I kept thinking, oh, oh, to be like Paul in that respect. I don't ultimately want to be like Paul. I want to be like Christ. But to give Christ that kind of infatuation, that kind of obsession where this is all he wanted to write about, all he wanted to talk about, all he wanted to pray about was Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're hearing from the Apostle Paul here. Now, we're hearing some other things as well, some other things associated with Christ and the cross. But when you read chapter 3, it's kind of like we're getting Paul on repeat. It's kind of like I've hit, and hit the rewind button and we're going back a couple of times to something we've already heard from the Apostle Paul. One of those things is him talking about how he prays for these people. You remember that? Back in chapter 1, we spent quite a while looking at what he divulged about how he was praying for these Christians. Back in chapter 1, it was him praying that God would give them this special spirit of understanding and wisdom so that they could know everything possible about the hope that was that now theirs being called by the Father and so that they could understand this inheritance that they're going to get to share with Jesus Christ. It's his inheritance But being in Christ, they're going to get to share that inheritance. And Paul wanted them to understand the power of God that was working in them at all times. Paul really wanted them to have that knowledge. And so every time he prayed for them, he's asking God to give them that knowledge. We talked about that back in chapter 1. Now here in chapter 3, Paul's going to tell these people another way that he prays for them. And he starts to do it in verse 1 of chapter 3. You heard me read it. For this reason, I, Paul, that's him starting to tell them about this prayer that he has for them. But it's like he stops himself quickly. He gets started and he stops himself quickly. And it's like he says, wait a minute, there's something else I need to tell you first so that then you can fully appreciate this prayer. And then for the next 13 verses, all the way through verse 14, Paul is explaining that. This is what you need to know before I tell you what the prayer is. So so the first 14 verses of chapter 3 are really that explanation before he gets back to the prayer in verses 14 through 21. 
We're going to get to that next week. We'll read it this morning, but we're not going to really dive into the prayer until next week. This morning, what I want us to see is what it was that was moving Paul to pray this way for these Christians. Not the prayer in chapter 1, this prayer in chapter 3. Paul's showing it to them. Paul wants them to hear how he's praying for them. But Paul also wants them to hear what's motivating him to pray that way for them. And as I go through these verses, I find three motivations. There are three things that Paul brings out which move him to pray this way for them. I think, again, over and over again, regularly, every time he goes to the Lord in prayer for them, I think he's lifting up this prayer for them as well. But why? Well, there are three reasons. I'll put them up here in kind of summary form for you this morning as we go through them. So look back at verse 1 with me, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, pray this way. Well, for what reason, Paul? When you see that phrase, for this reason, that's a phrase that's a lot like another word that we talk about sometimes, and that's the word, therefore. Remember, when you see the word, therefore, You know what's going on. It's a connector word, right? It it intends for you to look back to what's just been said, and that connects you to what's about to be said. Paul's doing the same thing here with for this reason. He's he's wanting to reach back to what he's just gotten done talking with uh, uh, in this letter to them, and what he's saying is what we just discussed, that truth, is the explanation, it's the basis, it's the foundation for what I'm getting ready to say to you. So it's kind of like, since that happened, since that is true, because, because of that, I pray for you this way. Okay? That's, that's, that's how this, this argument, this lesson is, is proceeding for Paul to these people. So we have to ask, what has Paul just been talking about? And we ought to remember that because we spent a couple of weeks in that passage that came just before this. So so remember what we saw over the last couple of weeks. Paul is talking particularly here to the Gentiles in this congregation. Does this go to the Jews in the Ephesian church? It does. There's no question about that. But Paul's got his mind particularly on the Gentile believers in this church. These are people who had been told over and over again, or they had been led to believe in some way, and they had come to think that they were second-rate with God. Jews are first-rate, Gentiles are second-rate. That the Gentiles are less than the Jews. That the Gentiles have less than the Jews. That the, the Gentiles are promised less than the Jews. That was a mindset that was there among the Gentiles because of their history because of the years before they became believers, and even since they became believers, that message was still given to them in different ways, and they were prone to believe it. And so Paul is targeting them with what he's saying in this letter, most of the letter. He's trying to erase that thought from their minds. Paul has been giving them detail after detail after detail to show them how the Father sent His Son as the Christ, the Savior, to live and die to give these Gentile saints the same thing that he's giving to the Jewish saints. What is, what is that? Reconciliation. Remember, that's been our word for the last two or three weeks. That's been Paul's subject for a number of verses back in chapter 2. Gentiles, the Father sent his Son to do what he did in life and death so that you get exactly the same thing that the Jewish saints get. You get reconciliation. And remember, we talked about reconciliation and how really Paul brings out two types of reconciliation. It's one package. It's all together. But there are really two types of reconciliation that have come to them through Jesus Christ. The first is reconciliation with God. Through the death of Christ, these Gentile believers have been given peace with God. Now, they needed that, didn't they? Because they were far away from God spiritually because of their sin. God's law demands righteousness out of all human beings. And for all who are not righteous, what does His law demand? Death. So sinners 
cannot approach God. Sinners cannot come into God's presence. Sinners can't be anywhere near God in that condition or His wrath and His justice will consume them. But Christ, but Christ, you love those words, right? But God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die to fix things with God. And He fixed things with God, not just for Jewish sinners, but for Gentile sinners as well. They've been reconciled just like Jewish Jewish sinners. They've been reconciled along with Jewish sinners. It's one of these great benefits that has come to these Gentile saints. The other form of reconciliation is reconciliation with one another. And not just with one another, other Gentiles, but one another Jewish saints too. They needed peace because they didn't have peace with one another. Because of the ethnic difference, because the Jews were biological descendants of Abraham and the Gentiles were not, there was a wall between these two groups of people. And there was enmity. Since the Jews had the law of God, they felt like they were superior to all the Gentiles. And because of that arrogance, the Gentiles resented the Jews. And so again, there was this friction, there was this hostility, there was this enmity between those two groups of people, but Christ's death got rid of that too. Christ's death broke down the dividing wall and it got rid of the source of their animosity. By Christ's death for them all, satisfying God's law for them all, giving God the righteousness He demanded of them all, paying the death penalty that was earned by them all, because of that, they were all the same before God now. They all had full access to the Father by the same Holy Spirit living and working within them. They had all been brought together into one group, one body. What we we saw last week, Paul kind of described as one nation, one spiritual nation, one family, which is the church. Jews, Gentiles, all brought into the church together, which Paul had just described as a building, right? If you go back to the end of chapter 2, Paul in verse 21 is talking about the whole building being fitted together and that building growing. And it's not just a building. This is not just another ordinary building, is it? What is it? It is a holy temple. Jews, Gentiles brought into this holy temple together, and that temple goes up and it goes out. It rests on, it depends on, it was begun with the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ himself. Everything about that holy temple originates from Jesus Christ, his person and his work. Everything about that building, the holy temple, rests on, it depends on the Son of God who became a human being to serve as the Christ, living and dying to save His people. That is the origination of the holy temple. That's that first stone that's laid that that dictates everything else about that temple. It's Jesus Christ Himself, His person and His work. Now the building, after Christ... The building then goes out and it goes up from the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And remember what we said about these these men. This is not, I don't think this is a combination of the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. I think Paul's language here in several different ways makes it clear he's talking about that group of men who are both apostles and prophets at the same time. These are those men that, that lived with Christ, at least 11 of them, lived with Christ day by day by day. Matthias was added afterwards. And then there there were several other apostles like Paul who came along later, all sent out by Jesus Christ himself to represent him, to be his messengers, to go out and proclaim the truth about who he is and what he did, and then at the same time to proclaim, to speak forth things that are going to happen in the future because of him, by him, for him. These are the apostles and prophets, the men who are both at the same time. That foundation goes out from Jesus Christ, goes up on top of what these men preach and proclaim. And every person, Jew and Gentile, who hears their message and believes in the one that they are proclaiming 
becomes like a living stone in that holy building. Being fitted together, cut, shaped, designed, placed in the exact location where the Father wants it in time and space so that the building keeps going up and growing larger and larger and its purpose is to be a dwelling place for God. This is where God's going to live. This is where God chooses to bring His presence to stay and not go away. The Holy Spirit lives in God's people, and lives in the group of God's people as a whole. Paul is saying, reaching back to chapter 2, Paul is saying, when I pray for you folks, I pray in this particular way, verses 14 through 21, we'll get there, but the reason I pray that way for you is because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. It's because of what God is doing through Jesus Christ. This this church that he is building with souls of Jews and Gentiles. You Gentiles are just as valuable in this temple as the Jewish saints are. And because God has put so much into building this building, and he's still putting so much into building this building, then I pray for you in a particular way. So... First reason, for lack of a better description, the first reason Paul is praying this way for them in verses 14 through 21 is because of the Father's work through Christ. His work to build the church. His work to bring up this holy temple of Jews and Gentiles. You Gentiles, he's doing this for you. So then I pray for you in this particular way over and over again. Reason number one. But that's not the only reason. There's something else that Paul brings out, and this is we get this from his little detour that starts in verse 1 and goes down through verse 8 or so. Okay, So I want to read verses 1 through 8 again, and then I want to bring out this second reason that makes Paul pray the way he does. So chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he has made known to me the mystery, as I I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. What is it? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We'll stop there. I know there's a comma, there's no period, and, and you want to keep going further, but, but, but I want to stop there to make this second point. Did you notice back in verse 1, how Paul identifies himself, or how Paul describes himself is probably the better way to say that. Did you see it in verse 1? What's he call himself? Prisoner. He calls himself a prisoner. Now, most scholars agree that Paul wrote this letter, as well as Philippians, Colossians, and his letter to Philemon, um, all at the same time, while he was in prison in Rome. And you, you remember the story of how he got there to his imprisonment in Rome, right? Remember, he was back in Jerusalem. He'd gone there for a feast. And he was falsely accused by the Jews of taking some Gentiles too far into the temple. Oh, you took them farther than they're supposed to go. And that riled up a Jewish mob. And they, they wanted to hurt Paul. They were intended to hurt him. Probably would have killed him if they could have gotten, if they could have gotten by with it. But a Roman soldier saw what was happening and took Paul into custody pretty much to protect his life. Well, after that, they had to have a hearing. They had to get to the bottom of why this had happened. You don't want this this uprising in in, uh, Jerusalem. The, The Romans can't have that going on. And so there was a hearing to find out, to get to the bottom of it, what had happened here, who was guilty, who was wrong, who was right. They had the hearing. In the hearing, Paul could see very quickly, I'm about to get railroaded. I mean, the Jews are really, they're really stocking the deck against me, and and I'm about to get railroaded, so what did he do? He appealed to Caesar. 
I don't want my case to be heard here. I don't, I don't want it to be decided before these Jews. I want to go to Rome, and I want Caesar to make the decision about whether I'm guilty or not. And Paul could do that because he was a Roman citizen. So after a couple of years and the long journey across the waters to get to Rome, Paul is now at this point in time under house arrest. He's not in a, ju- a dungeon He's in his own rented house. He had to pay for it. He's probably chained to a Roman soldier at all times. And while he's there, he's writing this letter and others to churches, to believers, to continue to minister to them at the same time. Now, what is interesting here is that Paul describes himself as a prisoner. But what doesn't he say? He doesn't say, I am a prisoner to the Roman government. He doesn't say, I am a prisoner to Caesar. What did he say? I am a prisoner to whom? To Christ Jesus, which, which kind of takes you off guard a little bit when you know the history and you know the story and you think, well, he should have been right. I'm a, I'm a prisoner of Caesar. I can't go anywhere. I can't get free from this Roman soldier. I can't, I can't leave the house that, that uh, I'm under house arrest in. I'm a prisoner of the Roman government. But he doesn't. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ. Why? Why, why does he view himself that way? Why, why is he saying that about himself? Well, it's very easy. Because from the moment Christ came to him on the Damascus Road, Paul knew he was Christ's. Period. I am Christ's. Sometimes he calls himself Christ's prisoner. Other times he calls himself his slave. But it's all the same to Paul. He knew he belonged to Christ Jesus. Christ had bought him, Christ owns him. Paul couldn't get free from Christ, and Paul didn't want to get free from Christ. It's not like that was an uh, an involuntary servitude or an involuntary imprisonment. Paul wanted to be tied to Christ that way. He wanted to, to live captive to Christ. Paul lived to serve Christ, and Christ had a very specific purpose for saving him that day on the road to Damascus, and for using him every day since then. You know what it was? It's what we just read in verses 2 through 8. Paul laid it out. He used different language to talk about it, but that's his explanation of why he exists as a child of God and as a servant of Jesus Christ. And it's here in verses 2 through 8 where it's kind of like Paul on repeat once again. He's going to tell them again how he prays for them, But here in verses 2 through 8, he brings up something else that he's already discussed with them as well. You know what it is? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 9, go back there if you will, one of the blessings that we discussed from the Father through or to the saints, one of those blessings was the blessing of illumination. Remember that? And in verse 9, Paul says, chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And then he goes on to describe what the mystery was. But but notice Paul said, God made known to us the mystery of his will. So he's already brought up this subject of something being a mystery for a long time, which is no longer a mystery anymore. Now in chapter 3, Paul comes back to it. He brings it up again. And Paul is trying to get these folks to to look back. Now, they're Gentiles. The ones he's he's particularly talking to are Gentiles, so they don't have as much knowledge in this history. But Paul is looking back to, to, to many, many years of God's relationship with Israel. And you think about all the types and the shadows and the symbolism that was present in many of the acts of God back during that period of time, even before God's time with the the Jewish people. Think back to the flood on the earth. We referred back to it several times in Sunday school this morning. Um, Exodus, the flood. I mean, think back to that time when God flooded the earth but saved Noah and his family only on an ark. When you look at that act of God, you start to see all kinds of types and shadows and symbols of something God was doing that was more than just that flood. It was about more than just that ark, and it was about more than just that one man and his family. God's saying more here, but 
What? What's he talking about? What's he pointing forward to? You think about all the pictures that were present in the law and the ceremonies that God gave to the people of Israel. You think about that Day of Atonement each year when they were required to bring one goat that was a sin offering and they brought another goat that was a scapegoat. And by killing the one, taking the other one way out in the wilderness and and letting it go, God made temporary atonement for the sins of his people for a year or so. But when you look at it, you, you, you have to stop and think, this is not just about those two goats. There's nothing special about those two goats. They, they symbolize something more. This is pointing to something bigger that God is doing or is going to do. It's, it's out in the future. It's, it's now. But, but what's the explanation? You think about all the prophecies that God gave through different prophets down through time. And, and, and you know, some of the things might be a little bit clear, but then there were other parts of those prophecies that were very, very vague. God's talking about Messiah, and he's talking about the salvation of his people, but who would be the Messiah, and when would he come, and, and exactly how would he save his people, and what people? So, so you see, when you look back in history from the time of this letter and the time of these Gentiles, there had been So much going on that left people asking, what is God doing with all of this? What's he up to? How's it all going to unfold? And and, and why is it going to come to pass this way? And Paul is saying, God didn't explain that to the sons of men in ages before. God didn't give the explanation. God didn't give the answers to their questions. He left it a mystery. And Paul wasn't the only one who talked this way. Turn to the right to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. You know, Paul wasn't the only holy apostle and prophet during this period of time. There were others. One of them was Peter. So look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse 10 with me, if you will. Peter in his language, his own language, is is saying the same thing Paul was saying to the Ephesian church. He's talking about the stuff that had been mysterious. It was going on. It meant something more, but God wasn't telling anybody exactly what it meant or all that it meant. 1 Peter 1, verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So what's Peter saying? Saying the same thing as Paul. What was Paul saying? They're both saying that God gave his prophets, prophets in the past, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Moses, the names go on and on. But but those prophets, God had given details, but he didn't explain to them what all the details meant. He gave them the prophecies, but he didn't give them what would be the fulfillment of the prophecies. It's like God gave them all the pieces to the puzzle, but he didn't give them the box with the picture on it so they could see how all the pieces came together. Can you imagine that? Suppose a friend gave you a thousand-piece puzzle in a bag with no box, no picture. How long is it going to take you to put all those pieces together? That's going to be tough, isn't it? That's kind of what it was like for the prophets of old, for the people of Israel in times gone bad. The Gentiles weren't getting any of it whatsoever, but even for those that were getting something from God, they weren't getting everything. It was still mysterious. And I want to show you, show you an example of this. We've got time for this. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 12 very quickly. Genesis chapter 12. This is a sample of God giving something, but not everything. God giving details, but not explaining all those detail, the details. And this one has something to do with these Gentiles that Paul is writing to in, Ephe- in the book of Ephesians, the letter to the church at Ephesus. Go, Gen- Genesis chapter 12 Look at verses 1 through 3. You know these verses well. We we covered them in our study through the book of Genesis, but you knew them long before that. 
Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here we have what seems to be probably the first statement of many more that came later, but the first statement of God's covenant with Abraham. Again, he would express it to Abraham several other times in several other ways, and then he would keep expressing it to Abraham's descendants after him, to Isaac and then those who who came from Isaac. This covenant promise statement over and over and over again. This is probably the first place. In it, we heard the command, right? Get out. Leave your family, leave your land, and you go to a land that I'm going to show you. I'm not telling you where it is yet. I'm not telling you the name of it. I just want you to start walking, and I'll tell you when you get there. That was God's command to Abraham. The promise that is in the covenant is, I'm going to drive everyone else out of that land. I'm going to make a great nation out of you in that land. I'm going to make your name great in that land. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's the covenant of God. Details, right? Several details. Enough of a command to tell Abraham what to start doing all uh, right away. But looking forward, there are promises. But could Abraham have any idea what those promises would look like when they came to fruition? No. There's still a lot of mystery here. There's a lot that is unexplained. How is God going to bless all the families of the earth when he is separating Abraham and his people from the rest of the families of the earth? What's the explanation of that? And how is he going to do that when he's even wiping out the families of the earth that live in that promised land? How is he going to bless the families of the earth when he's wiping out families of the earth for Abraham's sake and his people's sake? And how, why, how is he going to bless all the families of the earth when he's making covenants with Abraham and his people alone? See? Mysterious, right? It's a mystery. Here's the details. Here's the promise. But there's no explanation with all of this stuff. But God, later on, after Christ, gave the explanation to the Holy Spirit prophets, and apostles. So turn with me to Galatians. You're almost going to get back to the book of Ephesians. Stop short, one book. Go to the book of Galatians. And let me show you several things that Paul, one of the holy apostles and prophets, said to the church at Galatia based on what he knew, based on what God had then revealed to him about Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 3, sorry I didn't tell you that, Look at verses 7 through 9. Then there's two other short passages in chapter 3 that I want to read for you. Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations of the earth, all, all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Drop down to verse 15. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls it or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Drop down to verse 26. For you are, and he's writing to Gentile believers here at the church at Galatia, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. See? Genesis 12, 1 through 3, there's the promise. There's the covenant. Command, promise. Some of it is understandable. Abraham started walking. He, he knew he had to leave the stuff behind, even though he didn't leave everything behind. He still knew he had, to, he had to start walking to get what God was promising, but he had no idea how it was all going to culminate, where it would end up, what it would look like, and how all the other families of the earth are going to be blessed through him. What had been a mystery to him, to Abraham, and to to his descendants after him, even to prophets who came after Abraham, that mystery was revealed. It was explained to Paul, who was one of the holy apostles and prophets. And you can go back to Ephesians chapter 3 if you want to. Paul was talking about the dispensation of grace that was given to him. Well, this is it. This is what God had given to him, the revelation given to him through the effective working of his power through the Spirit. It was the Spirit who taught Paul or revealed to Paul that through Jesus, Jesus, the man who would be a physical, who was a physical descendant of Abraham, through him, people from all the families of the earth, Gentiles, would be blessed with righteousness and salvation. That Gentiles who trust in Jesus are sons of Abraham by faith, just as much as Jews who trust in Jesus Christ. They are alike sons of Abraham by faith. The Spirit revealed to Paul that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of God's promise. How? Through the blood of Christ. Through the death of Jesus Christ for them. Gentiles, just like he was for Jews. And this is why Christ took Paul prisoner. You know, in verse 8, he says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Christ took Paul prisoner on the road to Damascus. He regenerated him. He birthed him, he brought him to life spiritually, but he immediately took him prisoner to do something for him. He took him to give him this revelation that was not known before. It was was a mystery before. But to Paul, it was given, it was revealed, so that Paul could then go out among the Gentiles and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ among them. That's what Paul had done when he was with them bodily for two and a half to three years. That's what he was doing with this letter, writing to them more about the unsearchable riches of Christ, his life and his death and what the Father accomplished for these Gentiles through the life and death of Jesus Christ. But it's also why Paul prayed for them as he did. This was part of Paul's ministry, to preach this gospel? Absolutely. But Paul saw it as his ministry to want this for the Gentiles so badly. He wanted them to understand what used to be a mystery. He wanted them to grasp the, 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 the extraordinary work of Jesus Christ for them. He wanted that so badly for them that he didn't just preach it to them. He prayed for it for them. Regularly, over and over again, going to the Father saying, Give them this knowledge. Give them this understanding. Give them this appreciation of the unsearchable riches of Christ. What is theirs through the death of Jesus Christ? Paul is praying for it just as much as he is preaching for it for them. So, two reasons. The first is the Father's work through Christ, building the church through the blood of Jesus Christ, on the person and work of Jesus Christ, but also the Father's ministry that he gave to Paul to Proclaim this, preach it, get this mystery to the Gentile people. But there is a third motivation, the last one that Paul brings out, and and you find it in verses 9 through 11. Look there at those, if you will. Verses 9 through 11. Paul says, so he's supposed to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose 
which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, back to the questions. Why did God keep what he was doing a mystery for so long? Even a mystery to his chosen people, the the people of Israel. Even to prophets that he was giving revelation to. You know, these prophets were received, Daniel was receiving information about things that haven't, hasn't, things that haven't happened yet that are still out in the future. Why then keep so much a mystery? Why still hide so much from those people when you're giving them some? Why not give all of it to them? And the answer, I think, is, and you can debate this with me if you want to. You can come up with other answers. But I think the answer is this. Because if the Father explained himself to the Jews before Christ actually did what he was supposed to do, they wouldn't have believed it. So suppose to Moses, he lays out everything that he's going to do through Christ, all the benefits that are coming, but Christ hasn't done it yet. The Jews wouldn't have believed it. All they could see was God's favor on the Jews. That's all the nation of Israel could see. God favors us. Here's the box. We're in it. Everybody else is on the outside of it. All they understood about Messiah was that he is the Savior for God's chosen people, Israel. All they could imagine for the future was a renewed earthly kingdom of Israel where that earthly nation would be the glory of God on earth. All those people could see was the earthly separation of Israel from everybody else and the earthly exaltation of Israel above everyone else. They couldn't see with spiritual eyes. They couldn't see the spiritual similarity between the people of Israel and all the other families of the earth. They couldn't see the spiritual condition of all men and the solution needed by all men. God knew that. God knew that ahead of time. God knew that would be their mental capacity, their spiritual capacity. He knew it, and knowing it, he kept the revelation and explanation of that for after Christ had done it. Because he had a specific intent for the timing of everything that he did. He had a specific intent for when he sent Christ for what he wanted to happen after Christ. Christ did what he was supposed to do. So he's talking about in verse 10, to the intent, God's intention, God's plan, what what he's after, what he has laid out, what his purpose is, his intent, his plan. Verse 11, his eternal purpose has always been to glorify himself through the church. That didn't just start when Christ came. That's been his intent all through the ages. From the time of creation, before the time of creation, the reason for creation is to glorify himself through the church. And as we read there in verses 9 through 11, this this glorification is is pretty specific too, how how he wants it to take place. He wants the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We've seen that language before too, haven't we? It talked about Satan and his demons, his angels. But here it's not talking about Satan and his demons, his servants. We know that, right? Because they're not going to glorify God. No, now God is talking about the holy angels, those armies, those, those hierarchies of authorities in the angelic realm. He wants them who, as Peter said, have longed to understand what he's been doing all along. He wants them to see it now. He wants them to see the manifold wisdom of God, is what Paul says here. He wants them to marvel over the multifaceted brilliance of the Father as they watch it play out where? In the church. In this group of people. Jews and Gentiles who have equal access to the Father now through the Holy Spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ. He wants angels to watch the church and say, wow, the brilliance of God. Do you see that? Do you see what he pulled off here? You see what he's accomplished here? 
You think about the angels as they watched Jews and Gentiles who they know had no peace with God. These angels watched human beings, Jewish ones and Gentile ones. They watched them rebel against God. They watched us rebel against God. They watched us break every one of God's laws. They watched us live in idolatry. They watched us try to replace God with ourselves. They're watching now people who had no peace with God, and they watched these Gentiles and Jews when they had no peace with each other. These who were a part of the church at Ephesus together, Gentiles and Jews, before they were brought into the church, they hated each other. They didn't want anything to do with each other. They avoided each other like the plague. The Jews looked down on on the Gentiles. The Gentiles resented the Jews for looking down on them. Angels watched all of this happen. And now they're watching this same group of people enjoying peace with God and full access with God and peace with each other. And and, And they're watching these Jews and Gentiles unified in one body where they are worshiping and serving and living together and loving each other. And you imagine these angels thinking, who could ever have pulled that off? Who could have brought these sinners together with God and these sinners together with one another, where the sinners love God and the sinners now love one another and together serve God as a unit? Who could have done that? What did it take to pull that off? And the answer is, God did that. The Father did that. And the Father did it so that those angels will sit in the bleachers and they will watch in awe of Him. They will marvel over Him. In Paul's day when he's writing this letter, in our day 2,000 years later, a thousand years from now, if everything hasn't wrapped up and if if everything has wrapped up, in heaven for all of eternity, watching the church as the brilliance, the extraordinary, many-sided brilliance of God. That's what God did in sending His divine Son into the world as the Christ. He did it to bring together these people so that the angels will watch and say, Wow, what a God we serve. There is no other God like this God. No one is on the same plane with our God. No one exists who is parallel with this God. And the angels worship Him over what He did through the church. That's why Paul prays for him, for them as he does. Because the more these saints, these Gentile saints especially, the more these saints appreciate what's been done for them through Jesus Christ and why, what happens? They love Jesus Christ. They glorify Jesus Christ. They live for Jesus Christ. They want to imitate Jesus Christ. They they live in a way that shows how radically different they are and the angels watch and they praise God because of it. So Paul's prayers indirectly lead to the intent that the Father had. He is being glorified through the church. These are Paul's reasons. There may have been more, but these are Paul's reasons for praying the way he did. So how did he pray? Well, let me read it for you, okay? So look at chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Again, we're not going to park. We're not going to pick this apart. We'll do that next week, maybe the week after that. But I just want you to hear how Paul is praying for these folks for these reasons, motivated these ways. Look at verse 14. Paul picks up where he left off in verse 1 for this reason. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So he's praying for something to go on on the inside of them. This is not for for earthly blessings. This is not for a new house, a new car, more money. This is for something to go on inside of these people, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, every dimension of it, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think, 
according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory to the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. Amen. That's Paul's prayer for these people. Paul is very humbly, he's bowing his knee, he's very humbly, he's very passionately, and I would say probably regularly begging the Father to do everything necessary for these saints to understand and appreciate one thing, the love of Christ. That's it. That's his focus. That's the target. That's the goal. If they can have that one piece of knowledge, the extent of Christ's love, how deep is it? How wide is it? How high is it? How far-reaching is it? If they could just grasp the dimensions of Christ's love for them, then what Paul wants will be accomplished. Paul wants what the Father wants. What's the Father want? He wants to be glorified through the church. You putting the pieces together? If the church appreciates the love of Christ, what will the church do? It will glorify Christ. They will love Christ. We will praise Christ. We will, we will walk away from everything for Christ. We will try to live for Christ by imitating Christ. We will be obsessed with Jesus Christ. And if we're obsessed with Jesus Christ, if we're glorifying Jesus Christ, what else is happening? We are glorifying the one who sent Jesus Christ. We are saying that your purpose and your work is the most important thing to you, and guess what? It's the most important thing to us as well. We're on the same page with you, Father. You're all about your Son. We're all about your Son as well. And so these were Paul's reasons to pray as he did for these Gentile people. Knowing that, knowing that this is the purpose of God for the church, how should we pray? Should our prayer be any different than Paul's? for one another, for ourselves? What greater thing could we ask for from the Father than the knowledge of the love of His Son? Show us how much Christ loves us. Show us how far Christ went to love us, because what will happen if that prayer is answered? Just what I just said. Christ will be glorified by us. The Father will be glorified as we put our attention on Christ the way He wants as well. So, folks, I think we pray this way. We pray this way diligently. We pray this way regularly, humbly, passionately for ourselves, for for the knowledge for us, but for one another, too. What's, What's a greater way to love each other than to ask for this for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? I can't think of a better way to glorify God than to pray for His people in that same way. There's another way that we do it. That's with the Lord's Supper. Of all the things that Christ could have left for us as a way to worship Him, this is it. This is what He chose. He wanted to be remembered. He wanted us to to think back to the cross and His death on the cross. Why? Because He wants us to appreciate the depth, the length, the width, the height of His love. He wants us to be thinking about that all the time so that we will shower our, our love on Him, which will glorify the Father. So, He left this memorial service for us. That's why we do it every month. Could do it more often and it wouldn't be wasted time, but it's why we do it regularly because we want to use this way given to us by Christ Himself to express to Him how much we depend on Him, how much we love Him and adore Him and need Him and want Him to receive the glory that He deserves for coming as a man and dying in our place. So I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to sing a song of preparation, and then that's what we're going to do together. We're going to use the Lord's Supper to accomplish what Paul was talking about here as the intent of the Father. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we, we need greater words. We need more words to, to praise you for revealing what you kept hidden for so many of your people for so many years. Thousands and thousands of years, you, you had planned it, you were promising it, you were talking about it, but you weren't explaining it. You kept it a mystery on purpose because you intended to do something for our day. You were sending your son to make that church 
of which we are a part, where your Holy Spirit is dwelling to work so that you will be glorified by us before the angels in a way that had never happened before. Wow. (laughs) Not only that you did it, not only that you are doing it, but that you're including us in that? Paul meant for those Gentiles to be overwhelmed by that reality, that they're included with Jews in this remarkable work of God, this remarkable blessing of God. We should be just as overwhelmed. We should be just as amazed, just as flabbergasted that you would include us as a part of this and that we would receive so much blessing as a part of your eternal purpose and intent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We praise you for doing it. We praise you for your reasons for doing it. And we focus our attention on the one through whom you did it. You want the the spotlight to shine on your son, and you, you will get glory as he is glorified. So that's what we do. We put our attention on the Son. And Father, as we come to the Lord's Supper in just a second, as we hold the cracker, as we hold the little cup of juice, though they be meaningless little things, symbolically they are huge. What a way to express glory to your Son. Remembering that, His death, as the one thing that makes us who we are and gives us what we have for all of eternity. We trust in Nothing else. We trust in no one else. His life, His death on our behalf. He's special. He's unique. He stands alone. We eat His flesh. We drink His blood. No one compares. He gets the glory. and You get the glory for sending Him. That's what we want to happen in in a few minutes. So thank you for helping us with your word to get there. And I pray that As we think, as we remember, your spirit will work in our hearts to take us as far as you deserve for us to go in our worship this morning. And I pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.